we're gonna do weird sisters i found the cover of this one a bit weird there's like the fool just is super super ugly and is he meant to be super ugly i don't know um i always imagined him as like quietly fit but only once you look I don't know. So this was the first outing for Nanny Og and McGrath Garlic. Now I looked up the pronunciation of McGrath. Has someone commented on a previous video and asked me about it and said, oh, I'm not sure that's how you meant to pronounce it. So the author's own words, which I have now lost, considering the pronunciation, pronunci I'm going to just say that wrong. Considering the pronunciation, Terry Pratchett is quoted to have said, McGrath is pr pronounced mag rat doesn't matter what I think is right, everyone I've heard pronounce it has said Magrat. So, I think, personally, you're right however you pronounce it, because he didn't really care, he just kind of went along with what his fans did. So, good on him, death of the author and all that, but I'm going to keep going with Magrat, because Magrat's what I've always said, and I'm not sure I could change it now. No, my biscuit. My biscuit. I'll protect my biscuit from my life. Oh, do we need to do a plot summary? We should do a plot summary. So, basically, we have our three witches, and this one is a play on a Shakespeare play. And I've realised that I've always got Hamlet and Macbeth uh, mixed up. And I think this is why, because there seems to be a lot of Hamlet and Macbeth themes in there kind of brought together. And there's a lot of bits from As You Like It, which is another one that I haven't really seen, I've sort of vaguely know about. The scene where Duke Felmet descends into madness with the fool there is uh, directly pretty much taken from King Lear. Now I love the beginning of this book. It starts off with a bit of a preamble. He loves to describe the world as it sort of zooms in as you come in and he does this in a lot of the books where he sort of starts off either with the turtle or with just the general environment where he so this one he talks about the wind howling, setting the scene for these evil witches and then we start as the cauldron bubbled an eldritch voice shrieked when shall we three meet again? Eldritch, by the way, is an early 16th century word to mean sort of elvish almost. It's a Scots word, but it's more sort of sinister and ghastly, which is quite interesting because obviously Pratchett's elves are sinister and ghastly. It harks forward to lords and ladies in the books that have elves in them where he thinks of them as ghastly and horrible. When shall we three meet again? And there was a pause. Finally, another voice said in far more ordinary tones, Well, I can do next Tuesday. <laughs> Oh, I love this. And then we go back onto a bit about um, Great Artuin, and I just love that, just sort of, I love him. Um, and then we move into the Ram Tops. So the Ram Tops is where Lancra is, is basically. And this is where King Friends the First has been murdered by his brother, Lord Felmut. And Lord Felmut always makes me think of Pelmets, and then makes me think of that Miranda episode where she just walks around going, Pelmets! I don't know what Pelmets are! So I get very confused. Anyway, so the Duke Felmut is the baddie, basically. Well, his wife is the baddie, and his wife forces him to kill his brother, Ra rah, rah, he becomes king, because the son disappears. The son is a baby at that point. It kind of really becomes a very fairy tale -y thing then, because obviously the baby gets taken away by its three witchy, godmothery people, even though they're not technically godmothers, is given to a group of actors. These travelling actors go all round and end up back in Ankh-Morpork, our favourite city. The playwright, who goes around with these actors is called Howell and I think it is meant to be a play on Will, Will Shakespeare because as soon as he starts writing plays you kind of realise why. They're also trying to build a theatre called The Disc which is totally a play on the globe because obviously it's the disc world not the round world and I, I didn't notice that one for years because again I'm quite dim. So Lancra, while Lancra does appear in Equal Rights, in this book it's much more fleshed out, there's much more characters, and most of the plot appears in Lancra. Lancra is sort of based on the north of England, it's sort of a Lancashire feeling to it. Uh, there was a discussion on one of the Terry Pratchett Facebook groups this week around um, when Nanny Og says like, our Jason and our Sean, and where does that come from where you say our and then you say your son? I haven't looked scientifically into this, I've only just sort of read the comments. The general consensus that was that it's a working class English sort of phrase where, especially when you've got a lot of Catholic uh, family members where everyone was called Mary or John or a biblical name, it differentiates between people with the same names. Also it's quite working class and quite northern, which may be because there's a lot of working class people and demographically, you know, when you go to London in the south you get all the poshos, you know, they call their children Tiffany and Cassandra, I don't know, whatever they call their children, I'm not that posh. Other parts of the Ramtops do represent places like the Swiss Alps and stuff like that, but generally, in this book especially, Northern England is, is the feel he's going for. It felt like it should have ended about halfway through, 
there was sort of a climax and then it kind of went down down because granny went in and sort of talked to the um duke and tries to talk him down so they oh back to the plot so they've sent this baby away with all the actors um tom john is, is his name a few people got a bit confused and thought he was carrot he's not basically because carrot's meant to be the king of ankh Morpork and the Tom John's the King of Alankra, which is like nothing compared to Bob Bob. Anyway, so he goes away, they carry on, they think we've got to then sit here for 18 years waiting for him to become king and to become old enough to become king. Let's just go forward in time. They fly around a bit like Superman, really. I'm assuming that's what it's a reference to. Uh, go forward 18 years. So it kind of has a Sleeping Beauty um, influence there. Um, while Tom John in Ankh Morpork grows up for 18 years, he doesn't know who his parents are. He thinks that his parents are his adoptive parents, who were the um, actors. They then decide to build this disc, this theatre, and need money. In the meantime, the fool goes off to Ankh Morpork to find some actors. He finds the actors, gives them some money. They're like, way money so we can make our own theatre. They make their way back to Lancre. Granny does some stuff and it kind of feels like it's going to end because granny does this sort of goes and talks to the duke tries to end it all and it feels like it's working but the thing is that the duke's wife is super super clever probably a bit headology e herself and isn't taken in by anything and and it was i sort of thought the book was about to end and then it didn't and because i listen to audiobooks you don't know where you are in the book like in books obviously you can see how far you are and i got very confused um <laughs> then actors come in the reason the duke wants the actors to come is to do a play putting the witches in a bad light so people will stop trusting them he put wages this big war on the witches and it definitely plays on themes of how women are demonized even though they're helpful women that people in power are scared of them because actually they have the power the women have the power so he wants to have this play where they're old crones and that's where the when shall we three meet again happens in the play it's obviously it's from shakespeare but also it's kind of looking at how Shakespeare used to do propaganda. When you look at his history plays, they are all propaganda. When you look at the ones about the Wars of the Roses, that was him sucking up to the Tudors to be like, hey Tudors, you were nice. Richard III was a humpback, even though there's no proof that he was, except Shakespeare's plays because he wanted to make him look evil. So Ferenc is doing a political move using theatre. So once these guys arrive, and how will keeps on thinking that there's something wrong with the play. Howell seems to have this weird magical writing power and I wonder if this is based on Pratchett's own feelings of writing where he just feels the need to write um, or whether he's just making it up. I don't know. That may just be his process. And then he changes the play because he realises that the Duke actually killed the old king and he changes the play. Oh, I love it. And so obviously when people are believing the play and believing the evil witches, they're also going to believe that yeah, the Duchess is imprisoned, but is uh, killed by a collection of r vicious forest animals. Um, basically, I do think this is a play on Disney, isn't it? Uh, where usually the nice princess would like have friends that are all animals, whereas in this, the evil Duchess gets killed by them. I love that. It's so good. So Gren Granny Weatherwax goes and talks to Tom John and tries to get him to become king. And there's a whole scene around the crown because the real crown gets given to the players and they just in their basket of props. And the crown makes him into a king. But you're trying to work out, is it to do with him being good at acting? Or the crown being a weighty crown? And Tom, oh, Tom John is excellent at acting. And he is too good at acting. And it's uh, played all the way through the book. And it's quite manipulative. And it's quite scary. I have a cat on it. It's good. And in the end decides he doesn't want to be king. Then we realise that both the king, old king, and the queen were doing a bit of the naughty on the side. And actually... Tom John's father is not the king. And then there's the possibility that the fool's mother did the hunkery punkery with the king. So actually they're not half-brothers. They're kind of implied to be half-brothers, but they're literally not. They're literally just both illegitimate swapped over brothers. So the fool turns out to be Varenz II, because his name is literally Varenz, so he's Varenz II. This book also leaves us unsure of the fate of Magrat and Varence, which we later find out they get married and have all the babies and there's lots of funny stories about hungry punkery again and that's the plot so granny weatherwax the hag of hags as the wee free men call her she seems to be one of the only people who can see king Varence the first because he comes back as a ghost and it's all lots of fun granny had one sister called lily she dresses in plain black with an iron gray hard bun multiple hat pins i love a good hat pin basically I was thinking the multiple hat pins as just being extra sturdy. She's belt and braces. Also, it means that, I don't know, you could use them for something else if you pull one out. If you just got one, it's fine, but your hat flaps around a bit. It means you can run. It means you can do stuff. 
she's practical. And I really love the, the no warts plot line, how she just doesn't have any warts and she really wants warts. Whereas Nanny's image is a little more um, chubby. Pratchett always said that she was good and right, with capital G and a capital R, but that doesn't always make you nice with a capital N. She's also, she always seems quite sad with very few possessions. It's almost uh, monk-like. And also it shows the absolute opposite to the wizards with all their stuff, books, faff, food, everything. Granny is the complete opposite. She's skinny, she's small, she's neat, she's practical. And everything about her just seems to be about making her as opposite to a traditional wizard as possible. Granny is definitely much more complex in this novel and she gets more and more complex through every single novel she's in. And it's quite interesting how much she grows. She really is the most widened character of all of them. And I think she also changes as she gets older. I really, obviously I'll talk about this when we get to the Tiffany books, but she, at this stage, she's still a bit too haughty. She still has lessons to learn about softening up or not softening up, or knowing when to soften up. She also really thinks she knows everything. She pretends she knows things even when she doesn't. And she still seems young in this book. In this book, I'm assuming she's about 60, because by the end of the Discworld, she was about 80. And I'm, I don't know, I'm assuming this is 20 years before. It feels about right. Nanny Og. Nanny is just everyone's favourite grandma. So the way witches work is they are... Um, I'm going to have to find the word because I don't know this word. Oh, God, I've lost the word. So the way witches work is that they keep their surname. So um, Nanny Og, Githerog, all her children have the surname Og and all her husbands have the surname Og. So unlike a lot of other witches, she does get married and have a lot of children and a lot of daughters-in-laws. Oh, the kiss that lasted 15 years. Oh, that was so sweet. It's the first sort of proper soppiness in a in a Pratchett book. In Mort, he tried to do a bit of sort of romance, anti-romance, but then in this one, it's just much more cleaner. He's really, really developed his writing skills between this one and Mort, even in two books. And McGrath and Varenz, their relationship just sort of grows and they're both just so soppy. And it's hideous, but it's beautiful. And it just makes it all the more bittersweet when you don't know at the end if they've got together. And then there's a bit of, you know, a bit of a farce in later books. Oh, I love it. I need to stop saying I love things. I'm really sorry. This is just becoming soppy and I love this. Oh, and Death take part in the play. I'd forgotten about Death taking part in the play. And because everyone expects to see him, because there's Death in the play, like a character called Death, they all see him. But of course, they don't know he's the real Death. Otherwise, they'd be a bit terrified. Um, oh, that was hilarious. This really follows on with themes about leadership. It was explored with Coin in Sorcery and in Equal Rights with Esk, and about how that to lead, you have to have permission of the people to lead. You can't just randomly lead by yourself. And Granny tries to explain this to Thelma, and he doesn't understand, and this is why he goes to write, get this play written to try and demean the witches, which, to be fair, maybe that does mean he did understand, because he wants people to want him rather than the witches. So... Own goal there, Granny. Own goal. Previously, Coin, you know, his permission to lead wasn't there, so he made his own universe. Later on, he, he, he keeps exploring these themes with different people in different ways. So like in Guards Guards, where we talk about dwarves, and the dwarves just say, he's just a man who tells people what to do, and dwarves have quite a weird slant on most of these sort of things. And then obviously next book is Pyramids, and Pyramids again, you're talking about a king trying to work out how to lead. And I'll, I'll talk about it more there. I also, my autocorrects changed McGrath to Margaret, and I was getting, I go, who's Margaret? Who's Margaret? McGrath complains halfway through that uh, the other witches do their magic for selfish reasons, whereas she is doing it for other people. She's kind of missing the point there, really, isn't she? But it shows her naivety, and it shows how she always is fighting against the other two. The other two kind of know each other, they've got there, they're just going with it, and they know how they fit together. Whereas... McGrath is still young and trying to work herself out. And this whole thing about the three witches, and she wants them to be a coven of three. And the other two are just a bit like, nah. Uh, there's a really good scene where McGrath puts on jewellery and makeup. And I thought for a man writing it, it was pretty good. But I didn't take any notes of what page it was on, so I can't tell you any more about it. I also wanted to talk about the parallels with Hamilton, uh, randomly enough. Basically, one of the big overarching themes here is around how words affect your perceptions of reality. And there's a quote here from The Fool who said, the past is what people remember and memories are words. 
Who knows how a king behaved a thousand years ago? Well, exactly the same as the big overarching theme in Hamilton, that who lives, who dies, who tells your story. Um, and this thing of Thelmit bringing in a playwright to write a play about his reign, so that actually in future, no matter, even though he dies at the end, um, in future years, people might find that play and think that was what things were like. And that we see a lot of history through Shakespeare's plays. We see all I know about Alexander Hamilton is through Hamilton the musical, so and Wikipedia. So I may be very wrong, and he may not be a uh, Puerto Rican rapping genius. This book is so much deeper than the last few books. It's really starting to become a proper Pratchett book with a good plot. Although it's a bit meandering, it sort of it could be a bit tighter as a plot. I did feel in the middle that it was about to end, and then it didn't. Excellent puns. It brought in a new place. I think Ankh Morpork and the Wizards, he needed to rest them for a while because he'd done so much there. That's everything so far had been there. This is the first book. Other than kind of Mort, because Mort was obviously in Death's Domain, that is proper outside where we've been before, it delves into one of those places that Rincewind <laughs> faffed into in the first two books. And I really like that, that he seems to go through the first two books and go, right, today we're going to zoom into that bit of that book. And he does. This one has a pretty decent 4.12 stars on Goodreads. Although my Goodreads comes up with the purple cover, which I don't like anywhere near as much as the original, the proper one. The proper one. Yeah. I'm quite excited now. I was getting in a bit of a slump with sorcery. I was finding it really hard. I could read it. Reading it was fine. I quite enjoyed it. But talking about it was quite hard. Uh, hopefully I've got through my slump. And hopefully I've got through my cold and got through Christmas. So thank you for watching and goodbye.